Hi everybody, uh, thanks for tuning in. My name's Damien. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about kind of the CFPR seminars, where we're going, what we're planning, um, and to give you one myself. But firstly, if you're kind of new to the CFPR seminars, um, prior to this current situation, we used to run them every other week. And the plan was to bring someone in from within the center, around the center, outside the center, um, to talk about a topic that they were interested in. So that generally revolves around print, but we've had everything from photographers to jewelry makers to scientists, all sorts. So we try and run a, a pretty broad spectrum of topics. Um, so just keep an eye on it if you do think you'd be interested in there, because I'd like to think that there is at least you know, a handful of things going on that you could find interesting. Um, and I would say even probably a couple of things that you didn't realize you might be interested in. Um, so the plan now is to run them every week. Um, Wednesday, one o'clock is a normal uh, live time, as it were. Um, but there's also a plan to record these now. So it feels a bit more fair if for whatever reason you weren't able to make the live session or you'd like to refer back to them later on, maybe find some more of the references or material that was mentioned in it. Um, it just feels a little bit more fair. Um, at the same time, I would encourage you to turn up to the live sessions. They are good fun. Um, and there's some interesting discussion that goes on in them that I haven't quite worked out how to fold into this recorded format just yet. Um, but anyway, um, so yeah, my name is Damien. Uh, I wanted to talk to you today about something, like I say, very different to maybe what you might think what, about a print seminar. Um, and I chose it mostly because it's a topic that was new to me. Um, I'd done some work adjacent to it, but I really wanted to, to use this as a chance to learn something new. Um, and so today I want to talk about the underwater photography of Rio Minamizu and how this uh, informs uh, some of the thoughts of mine that go into things like colour and camouflage of pelagic marine life. Um, so pelagic here just means um, the open ocean when we're talking about waters. Right, so uh, first thing first, a disclaimer. Uh, I should probably let you know that I'm not a photographer, I'm not a diver, and I'm not a marine biologist. So as I mentioned, this is really a topic that I'm interested in, and I thought this would be a good chance to learn about it, consolidate what I found, and pass on that information. But you know, do take these things I say with possibly a grain of salt. Go out there and have a look at some of these references and some of this material. Have a look for yourself and um, just double check because... Uh, I think, I think I've got it right, but you never know. Um, so to give you my background with the sea, this is more my sort of speed. This is um, Skegness on probably the sunniest day it's ever seen. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's more my sort of scene when it comes to the open ocean. Um, so this all stems from a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'm discussing with a friend of mine who's a biologist about the origins of colour in nature. And I've been particularly interested in these things called structural colours. Um, where there is essentially colour made by the formation of a structure and there's no pigment involved, the colour just arises from the interactions of the light with that formation, with that formed structure. Um, so he was interested in asking whether these things kind of popped up in marine life. Uh, and he sent me this image uh, with a link to Rio Minamizu's website. And he was asking, oh, is, is this the same idea? Is what's going on here a structural colour or is it something different? Well, it turns out it is something very different, but that led me down this kind of rabbit hole of finding out that it's a, a very interesting subset of colour itself. Um, so if you're an animal in the open ocean, you have to do some very, very clever tricks in order to remain camouflaged because you have nothing really to hide behind. There's no features, it's just you <laughs> and a big open space. Um, but he sent me these images and I was really Im like immediately fascinated with, with what they are. I, I still haven't managed to track down exactly what this animal is, um, but it's very alien looking and uh, just when, when you start to think about that, that common uh, trope about how we know very little about what goes on under the oceans, in fact we know more about the moon than we do know about the, the bottom of the oceans of Earth. And you start to see these very alien life forms again. It's uh, just a very strange combination. But when you go to his website, you can see all sorts of images like this. So again, I no idea what this is, some kind of larval creature. Um, but again, very alien and very vivid. 
Um, and just one more because it's a personal favorite. We got this little larval crab uh, riding on a jellyfish. But yeah, definitely head to his website, take a look. There's entire galleries of this stuff. Um, really fun to trawl through. Um, but this got me thinking about a lot of things. Um, but first, I'll just kind of give you a background on Ryo Minamizu himself. Um, so his kind of MO is uh, underwater photography, and he mostly does this off the coast of Japan. Um, and when you go to his website, there's a, a kind of a mission statement on there that I thought was quite interesting. Um, and one of the main things he, he kind of presses is that he's interested in capturing the diversity of life. So again, um, when we discuss that we, you know, we have very limited knowledge about the variation of species under the water, you can imagine that only increases <laughs> as you go down in scale. So the smaller and smaller you are, the less likely we are to have actually seen, recorded, um, you know, given names to these things. And so there's possibly, you know, things that he's taken pictures of that no one's really given a name to, no one's really classified. Um, and that, that I think is quite interesting in itself. So he, he states that he's really interested in capturing the diversity of life at the millimeter scale and below. So this is, you know, very, very close up, very small scale underwater photography. And to make things even harder, um, he tends to do this under low light nocturnal photography conditions. Um, so he came up with a process called the black water dive. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but it's essentially a method for lighting um, underwater photography at night. It's quite clever. Um, and it serves multiple purposes, but it was using this um, that he produced a work called The Secret World of Plankton, um, and that was actually the winner of the National Geographic Photo Prize in 2016. So it's definitely worth a look, um, because you'll get a very good idea about, you know, the sorts of images that you'll see uh, from Min Minamizu himself, um, but it's, it's just a really good kind of collection of his work, I think. Um, and one of the things I found really quite interesting about him is that he's not only published in these kind of photographic circles, so he's not known just for his photographic skill, but he's also contributed a lot in uh, things like biodiversity. So you can find uh, find him on Google Scholar, for instance, and look up papers where um, he's listed as an author. And a lot of times this is just from him providing images of certain types of creatures. So um, quite often you'll find that uh, someone like this, someone who's very hands-on um, in that situation that is just able to provide information to scientists who may not be able to access the areas so easily. Um, they're very useful um, in, in allowing people to, again, classify and understand what's going on um, under the water. So just a very interesting chap all around. Um, so this is one of the uh, the videos that I wanted to show you. Um, it doesn't work too well in the screen recording, so what I'll try and do um, is I'll leave a link to it somehow attached to this video. Um, and what I've done is I've just taken a few screenshots from that video coming up. Uh, but this is what I say, this black water dive idea, um, whereby he goes out at night in order to get the images he wants. So, in the background here, what you can see is some ambient low-level lighting. So these are intended to be not particularly bright, just lots of them at a low level to give um, a kind of general illuminescence. Um, this, uh, this actually has a secondary function in that it attracts a lot of the wildlife, so there's some phototaxis going on there as well. Um, essentially a lot of the little creatures underwater are drawn to these things and they turn up, um, but great care is kind of taken here in order to ensure that um, this doesn't become like an obvious spot for predators to turn up to. So uh, they discuss how they vary the sites of their their black water dives and they vary the time so that there's no regular pattern that allows predators to be like, okay, this is the time in which I go and feed on all these small creatures turning up. So this is um, the video, like I say, and this is the, the camera setup they use. So it's very, very high tech, lots of different lighting going on here. We've got a general illuminator that seems to stay on the whole time. Another further field one, probably just for looking where you're going. Um, this kind of backlit illumination, um, helping to illuminate the target as well. And then these two strobe flashes that are set so they don't interfere with one another. Um, but this, this does both um, photo and video from what I can tell. 
um, and the video very quickly moves into giving you a kind of a closer look through the lens. So, uh, again, not sure what type of animal this is, maybe some kind of larval eel or something like that. Uh, this is the main body that moves, and this is some kind of trailing tail that leaves behind it. Um, but this is the kind of thing you'd see through the lens. Uh, I'm not quite sure exactly what the length scale is here, but I think it's, it's an interesting part in the video to watch just because of all this background noise. Um, and these are all other creatures. So um, what happens is it focuses on this, this, this animal kind of moving through the water, and all of these things in the background are just going haywire and moving about. So it's a very busy situation. But as you start to move in closer and you zoom in a bit more, it manages to capture um, single larval creatures um, just in the water moving through it. Um, just as a quick bonus, I just wanted to quickly talk about this uh, squid that shows up. Um, in terms of colour, when you watch the video, what you'll see is that he's moving through the water quite quickly um, and the colours on the squid are changing rapidly between this kind of orangey yellowy kind of uh, color here and this white here and this is in time with the movements that the body makes um, so these squid are quite interesting chromatophores they're basically tensing their muscles um, and that is changing the pigment because they have these uh, small sacs that basically contain the pigment and they're, they're hidden and illuminated by this muscle contraction so it's a very interesting system on its own um, probably a, it's probably a little bit more complex than that in, in total but um, definitely worth reading about if you get the chance um, so yeah, learning about all of this uh, made me kind of think a, a little bit about what I know about the way colour is produced um, in general and how that might change when you move to an underwater situation. So as you can imagine, the response of light as it moves through water is very, very different to how it would move through air. Um, this is uh, obvious when you start to think about the fact that water is a lot denser than air, so there's a lot more molecules condensed per unit area than there is in air, and therefore there's a lot more chance that a, a photon of light will be somehow scattered or absorbed or, you know, it is somehow lost as it moves through um, a set amount of the medium. So this is um, a kind of general <laughs> figure that shows that uh, down the bottom here we have the, the visible spectrum. This is just a small amount of um, electromagnetic waves that we can perceive with our eyes. Down here we have um, violet, blue, moving through green, yellow, and all the way up to these reds. Um, and up here we just have attenuation. Now attenuation is just, as I say, uh, the probability that the light will be lost as it moves through, say, a meter or something like that. So up on this, this red end of the spectrum, the values are incredibly high. This means that red is attenuated very, very quickly um, as it moves through water. Meanwhile, blue and green, to a certain extent, can propagate a lot more freely. Um, this is one of the reasons that when you look underwater, everything has this nice blue hue to it. Um, it is a little bit more complex than that, but it is one of the reasons. Um, but one thing to keep in mind um, here is that all of these values are much larger than they are in air. And this just means that your kind of line of sight distances are a lot smaller. Um, did some general kind of reading about this, um, and one of the kind of general rules of thumb I found was that if you want to take a picture of something underwater and you want to clearly capture it, then you need to be at least um, within a meter of it. Otherwise, you start to lose color, you start to lose contrast, you start to lose definition, all of these kind of ephemeral ideas of what makes up like a really good picture. Um, but just a, a little interesting side note. Um, and this, as I said, got me thinking a little bit more about how color is manipulated and used um, by pelagic marine life in order to, um, in order to stay hidden. Um, and in order to blend in with their environment to, to survive in these open oceans where, again, you really have nowhere to hide. There's no features, no environment. Um, land animals tend to blend in with their surroundings, knowing that they'll constantly be among features. But here you're basically uh, in a big open space. So you have to get very clever in how you respond to your environment in order to hide. So looking through this, I found a really good review paper. I'd highly recommend it to anyone interested in the topic uh, by Johnson in 2014. Um, it's titled Hide and Seek in the Open Sea, 
pelagic camouflage and visual countermeasures. It's really good. Um, again, this is not my area, but I felt reading that paper that I got a really good grasp on the topic quite easily. Um, and he basically splits this into, uh, sorry, they basically split this into three main methods. Um, so the three main methods are transparency and reflectivity and pigmentation. Um, now, what's interesting about that is that they kind of uh, self-sort. So we have this zone up here, the epipelagic zone. This um, contributes kind of zero to 200 meters below the surface. And then we have this mesopelagic zone, uh, which is around 200 to 1000 meters below the surface. Um, typically, transparency and reflectivity are the methods used up here in this epipelagic zone. But then as you go deeper, um, you start to see a little bit of transparency, uh, but mostly a lot of pigmentation going on. Um, and this is actually a product of um, the differences in light that you have at these different depths. So as we discuss these ideas and we discuss why they arise, actually one of the reasons that they arise is kind of the differences in light as you move further from the surface. So just something to keep in mind while we discuss this. So probably the most obvious one, um, if you don't want to be seen, just make yourself invisible. Um, this is very common um, in a lot of the larval forms that we were looking at at the beginning. Uh, very common in things like jellyfish, um, even eels. Um, if you've ever seen any of those very alien looking eels where they're these very, very thin shapes um, and they're, they're quite transparent, that's done intentionally so that the light has very little um, space to propagate through as it moves through sideways. So again, um, it's it's an evolutionary trait. It's it's nothing. It's not. There's a there's a point to it. It's not just um, a random in any way, shape, or form. Um, so this this relies on the fact that there are very few kind of biological building blocks that are inherently strongly coloured. Um, there are probably a couple that you know straight away. Things like hemoglobin, for instance, are very very strongly coloured. But you can get away with them. Um, in big inverted commas, building creatures that don't use some of these. Um, and the kind of trade-off here is that you lose a lot of complexity. So although you can build a creature um, that is mostly quite transparent as seen by the jellyfish here, uh, they really lack features like eyes, um, really any very strong locomotive abilities in general, and things like kind of armored coatings and shells. So eyes have to be opaque in order to work. Um, they have to absorb light um, in order to function, so they can't be transparent. Um, things like locomotive abilities, these just mean um, you, you kind of struggle to get very complex locomotion going on if you want to remain entirely transparent. Um, and things like armor coatings um, in general, they, they're very strong, and those strong materials tend to be opaque. So that's just one, one part. Um, of the kind of uh, methods that they use to remain hidden is this idea of transparency. Uh, the other one is a little bit more complicated. So this is reflectivity. Um, you've probably seen it quite a lot. It's very, very common in fish. So they will have these kind of silver mirrored scales on the side of them. And this relies on a kind of trick of the light. So as I mentioned, um, the light is different towards the surface than it is lower down. And so when we think about how light would move through the system, we can say that uh, if I was in the water, I could tell the difference between above and below, but I would very much struggle to tell the difference between say left from right. And this relies on that fact. So if I'm this person down here underwater looking at this fish, and what instead this fish does is it reflects light from over here directly into our eyes, um, it messes with our perspective a little bit because we know that this has the same sort of idea. Uh, this is the same environment, this is just more water. And so we struggle to determine exactly where the fish is, how far away it is, um, and where exactly we're seeing it from. If we even perceive it to be there, because you can imagine that this would uh, somewhat shield it in some way as well. So, as I say, this relies totally on the fact that light is symmetric from here to here within the water. Um, 
Now, there's, there's been some interesting studies on this. So people have looked at the way the scales are oriented on fish. And it looks like um, in certain species in particular that this is very much intentional. So the scales are oriented in such a way that it would enhance this um, as much as possible. So again, this points to an entirely evolutionary tactic. This is very intentional. Um, but as I say, very common in fish. So something you've probably seen before and maybe not thought about too much. Uh, and finally, one of the interesting ones in terms of camouflage is pigmentation. Now, straight away, you'll probably be like, well, this isn't very well camouflaged, and you'd be right. Uh, so these are helmet jellyfish. Um, <clears throat> they tend to sit very, very deep under the surface, like I say, in that mesopelagic zone, um, but are sometimes brought to higher up um, parts of the water by um, currents and whatnot. So they're particularly found in Norway or at Mug fjords and whatnot. So a lot of the pictures that you'll see are from when they are brought to these um, closer to the surface. And uh, just in general, they stick out a lot more um, against this backdrop of uh, greeny, bluey water. Um, so I mentioned that pigmentation was quite common as you get further down, but it's not entirely true, um, as some of the shallower depth creatures are actually blue pigmented. So if you want to remain unseen in a giant vat of blue, you just paint yourself a bit blue, um, and that helps quite a lot. But this pigmentation is probably a bit more interesting for the very deep sea creatures like the helmet jellyfish over here. Um, now, I talked before about that red has a lot of trouble moving through the water. So if I want to remain hidden, I would either, you know, I would either choose a pigment that is black, and so any light that's shone onto me reflects very little, or I would choose red because I know that um, when that light reflects back off of me, it's, it's going to struggle to move very far from my body before it's absorbed. So this painting themselves red essentially paints themselves invisible in the kind of uh, darker depths of the water. Um, so it's just a very kind of clever idea. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen any of those kind of documentaries where they look at uh, very deep sea wildlife. Um, it, it never kind of struck me, but now thinking back on it, there's a lot of them are red, like uh, a, a very large proportion of them are red. And um, this is why, because um, it helps them to remain unseen. So just an interesting little side bit. So some discussion points that I thought might be interesting. Uh, so going back to uh, Minamizu's photography, uh, as I say, they're really beautiful photographs. Um, but immediately, first thing I have to think is, are these the kind of true colors? Um, is what we're seeing here, what was immediately captured by the camera? Or is there some kind of enhancement going on in post-processing? Um, an interesting question that probably varies depending on whether you're a photographer or not is, um, is this somehow dishonest? Are we uh, somehow enhancing real life by <laughs> affecting these colors? Or is, is, there, is there a kind of a color uh, is the color of an object defined by the object itself, or is it defined by the observing lens? Is it is it defined by the camera? Um, so our eyes would see it slightly differently, and the, the camera sees it differently to that. But you know, what, what what is in fact the true color of this material? And finally, uh, what sort of color would you even assign to something that doesn't want to be seen? So say these are somewhat transparent and uh, enhanced in some way. Um, how would you even know how to color them uh, in order to make them look somehow appealing? Or just in general, uh, what kind of colors would you even apply to something that is doing everything it can to remain unseen? So thank you for listening to me ramble on. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. There should be a few more talks coming up in the coming future. Um, so please stay tuned. Thank you.